In this video, we're going to focus on qualitatively analyzing the properties and behaviors of wave functions according to the Schrodinger equation. While there's no substitute for actually solving the equation and finding the mathematical form of the wave function, we can actually get really far without doing that. As long as we don't care about the precise values, we can actually draw the wave function qualitatively, incorporating all of the most important features of the wave function based on just a handful of fairly simple rules. As mentioned in the previous video, we're going to be focusing on the time-independent version of the Schrodinger equation, so we're only going to be worrying about systems that are in equilibrium. I've written psi explicitly as a function of position here, but I'm going to be dropping that going forwards just because it's a lot to write. Also recall that this left-hand term is related to the kinetic energy of the particle, and therefore also to its momentum squared. The middle term is related to the potential energy of the particle due to the influences of any fields or forces acting on it. And the rightmost term represents the total energy of the system. So at its heart, the Schrodinger equation is really simply a statement of conservation of energy. Also recall that this is an eigenvalue equation. The solutions psi of x to this equation are functions such that the left-hand side of this equation, basically, a combination of operators acting on our function is simply equal to a number times the original function. And the eigenvalue, the number here on the right, is simply, simply represents the total energy of our state. For the purposes of qualitatively analyzing the solutions, it's actually easier to rewrite the Schrodinger equation by moving some terms around like this. This is the same equation as before, but I've collected my terms so that I have a second derivative of the function on the left and I simply have a number, or a function, times our wave function on the right. The second derivative represents the curvature of a function. It's the rate of change of the rate of change of a function. So it tells you how quickly the slope of a function is changing. And as we can see, the curvature depends on a few things. One is the mass of the particle and the value of Planck's constant, but these only affect the value of the curvature, their constants. And so we can safely ignore them since we're only going to be looking at the qualitative behavior of our wave function. It also clearly depends on the value of the wave function itself. If the wave function is large, it implies that the curvature is also going to be large. Likewise, the sine of the wave function also contributes to the sine of the curvature. Lastly, the difference between the energy of our system and the potential at a certain position affects the curvature. If e minus v is either a large positive or a large negative number, it implies that the curvature will be correspondingly large in value. The sign of this term of differences will also influence the ultimate sign of the curvature. In case some of you are not very familiar with uh, curvature of a function, let's talk about some of its general properties. So if curvature can be positive or negative. Positive curvature means the slope of the function is increasing, and a good way to remember this is that positive curvature is happy curvature, and happy curvature is smiling. It doesn't matter whether the function is negative or positive. If it's positive curvature, it will always be curving upwards, forming something kind of resembling a smile. In both cases, the slope starts out negative, and by the time we go around the bend, our slope ends up positive, and so our slope has been becoming increasingly positive from the left to the right. Negative curvature is the opposite, it means our slope is decreasing, and negative curvature is sad, and sad curvature is frowning. In addition to positive or negative, curvature can also be large or small. Large curvature means the slope is changing rapidly, and that tends to produce narrow peaks or valleys as the slope changes quickly over a small distance. Small curvature means that the slope is changing very slowly, and that tends to produce much less pronounced bumps, you typically spread over larger distances. Now let's look at the equation itself. When the curvature of a function is equal to zero, we call that an inflection point. It means at that point, the function is switching between curving upwards and curving downwards or the other way around. The inflection points of our wave function occur when E is equal to V. In order to see how to make use of this, let's draw a potential energy function. You can interpret what I've drawn here as kind of a, a valley. If this were gravitational potential energy, then we have a hill on each side and a lower point in the middle. This curve represents the amount of potential energy that a particle must have to exist at a particular location, 
For example, if we have a particle right here, it must have an amount of potential energy equal to the value of the curve over here. At this point, something we often do is we draw a horizontal line corresponding to the actual total energy of the system. If our system is defined by this particular total energy, we would say that the particle is confined within a range between these two points, where the potential energy is equal to the total energy. After all, when the particle reaches one of these points, all of its energy is in the form of potential energy, there's no kinetic energy left, and the particle would not be able to go any higher up the hill. But according to the Schrodinger equation, these points don't represent places where the wave function has to be zero. They represent places simply where the curvature is switching from positive to negative or the other way around. To understand how to actually go about constructing a wave function, let's assume that the wave function has a positive value at x equals zero. Note that the wave function doesn't have units of energy, so technically it's being drawn according to its own vertical axis. But since we're only going to care about the qualitative behavior of the wave function and not the actual values, I'm not even going to bother to draw its own axis. But it should be understood the wave function scale here is arbitrary because it is scaled according to its own distinct axis. You also might be thinking, how can you just assume that it has a positive value at x equals zero? What if it's negative? If you think back to what we learned about the overall phase of a wave function, we established that if you just insert a negative sign in front of a whole wave function, you don't actually change anything physically. There's no measurable distinction that can be made between um, those two particular wave functions. That means if I make this assumption and I do all the rest of our analysis based on an assumption, at the end I could always multiply the whole thing by negative one, what was positive will now be negative and vice versa, but the resulting physical behavior and the probability density will not be any different. In between these two inflection points, the value of e minus v is positive. At x equals zero, I've said that my wave function has a positive value, and e minus v is positive, and that means the curvature has to be negative. A negative number times a positive number times a positive number is equal to a negative number. That means our curvature is negative. And as long as the wave function remains positive within this region, then the curvature has to remain negative because e minus v is also positive in this whole region. Now you might be asking, why did I draw it this way? For example, why didn't I make the wave function go down into the negative uh, region? So what I'm drawing here is a possible solution. I'm not drawing the only solution to the wave function, first of all. And the other thing to keep in mind is that I already know the rest of the rules and I'm making sure that I'm following all of them, even though right now I'm only really trying to demonstrate one of them. Once we reach these inflection points over here where the curvature changes, our wave function has to go from curving downwards like this to curving upwards on the left, which means curving upwards from the left to the right, and likewise on the right-hand side, curving upwards from the left to the right. And keep in mind that this represents one of the possible solutions to the Schrodinger equation and not necessarily all of them. And before we dive into why I drew some of the details the way I did, let's think about what this actually means. We just established that this is how much energy our system has in total, which means our particle cannot move to the right of this point over here or to the left of this point over here because there's not enough energy to do so. But the wave function is our probability density amplitude. We can construct the probability density by taking the magnitude squared of our wave function. But our wave function has non-zero values outside the region in which our particle should be confined. That implies that the probability density is also non-zero in those regions, and that means that if we were to actually compute the probability of finding a particle outside of the region in which the particle should be confined, we have a non-zero chance of doing so. It is possible to find the particle outside of the region in which it has enough energy to exist. This seems nonsensical, but it's true, and it's been experimentally verified time and time again, and in fact, it even represents a technological constraint in some of our electronic technology. For example, a transistor is essentially a potential well in which an electron is trapped. But sometimes, the electrons can essentially escape from their well um, by, because of the fact that there is a non-zero probability for the particle to be found in that location. But let's say we do an experiment, we make a measurement, and we find that the particle is right here, in a region where, according to classical logic, it should have been impossible to find it. 
If I now measure the energy of this particle that I found outside of the classically forbidden zone, I'll find an energy that's at least equal to the value of the potential energy at that position. So it seems like energy came out of nowhere, but it's not entirely true. Just like how there is fundamental quantum uncertainty in the spin of a particle, there is also similar fundamental quantum uncertainties in its variables of position and momentum and therefore energy as well. If you think back to when we were learning about the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in terms of spin, that's actually not how the uncertainty principle was first formulated. Heisenberg first wrote it down as an uncertainty relation between the uncertainties in position and momentum. Part of your homework is actually going to be deriving this uncertainty principle based off of the position and momentum operators that we established earlier. But let's think about what this means. Before we measured the position of our particle, it had a large uncertainty in position. It could exist anywhere from basically somewhere over here to somewhere over here. If its position uncertainty is large, then its momentum uncertainty can be small. And if the uncertainty in its momentum is small, then the uncertainty in the particle's energy is also small, and so it has a fairly well-defined amount of energy. But the moment we measure the position's location, what we're really doing is we are collapsing the wave function. If we measure the particle to be right here, we're saying the particle is no longer described by this purple wave function, but instead it's described by a wave function that looks something more like this. After all, I found the particle right there, which means within the uncertainty of my measurement, the particle's position is confined to a very small location. That means delta x, the uncertainty in position, is now very, very small. And if delta x is very, very small, then the uncertainty in momentum has to be correspondingly large. And if the uncertainty in momentum is correspondingly large, then the energy of the particle is no longer well-defined. And in fact, this particular collapsed wave function here has extremely large curvature, and extremely large curvature means that the difference between E and V is very large, which means E is now going to have to be bigger than V. Now let's go back and let's draw a different wave function that would be a solution to the Schrodinger equation for this particular blue potential energy. Typically, in order to get a separate solution to the Schrodinger equation, we need to actually change the value of E. Generally speaking, each solution of the Schrodinger equation corresponds to its own unique value of energy. There are some cases where different solutions can have the same value of energy, but we're not going to worry about those. So let's slide our energy upwards so that we can find the next solution to the Schrodinger uh, equation. This means that the region in which we'd expect to find the particle classically is a little bit bigger. It, goes, it stretches farther on each side. But it also means that the curvature has to be steeper, has to be larger than it was before. So if we put back our old wave function as a reference, we need to make sure that the curvature is steeper this time. But now our wave function has decreased so quickly that it reaches zero. And when the wave function is zero, the curvature is zero, which means we once again have inflection points here and here. Inflection points means the direction of curvature changes, which we can also see by the fact that our wave function is now going to become negative. And as it becomes negative, we have a negative times a positive times a negative for an overall positive curvature. So now our wave function is going to have to start smiling on each side. And also, while it's hard to actually draw well, the curvature has to decrease in magnitude as we get farther and closer and closer to these turning points over here, because the difference between E and V gets smaller, which means the magnitude of our curvature is going to go down. But once we reach these turning points over here, these are also inflection points because they are where E minus V is zero. So our curvature was once again, once again must change. So here we have positive curvature, which means we have to shift towards negative curvature. You might have noticed that I keep drawing the wave function asymptoting towards zero past the classical turning point. These regions where the potential energy ne needed to be there is greater than the actual total energy of our state are called classically forbidden zones. And for a wave function to make any sense, it has to it has to asymptote towards zero in one of these classically forbidden zones that extends off to infinity. And the reason for that is because if it didn't, if it instead asymptoted to a finite number or diverged, it would be impossible to make sense of this wave function. It would not be possible to normalize it because the area under our wave function 
would be infinite in either of these circumstances, right? A finite number off to infinity adds up to an infinite area, and a diverging area off to infinity is even worse. So in order for our wave function to make sense as a probability density amplitude related to the probability of finding the particle within some region, it has to asymptote towards zero as we approach x equals positive or negative infinity. This is actually really important because, for example, if we imagine our wave function actually continues along this black curve, this actually might be a solution to the Schrodinger equation for a particular value of energy. However, what this is telling us is that it doesn't make sense to have a state with that much energy in this particular potential well. Having that much energy results in a wave function that is physically meaningless. And if the wave function for that value of energy doesn't make any sense, what that's really telling us is that there is no physical state with that amount of energy. The energy of a bound system in quantum mechanics, where we don't have enough energy to just go off to infinity, has to be quantized. The state can only exist as particular values of energy such that the wave functions make physical sense. So for example, let's say that this particular energy does work, that it corresponds to this pink wave function, which is normalizable and therefore can correspond to a physical state. If I were to shift the energy just a little bit up or down, it would modify the curvature. And by modifying the curvature, these ends would no longer quite asymptote to zero. And of course, I should have also redrawn the wave function in here. It should also be a little bit different, but it's kind of a pain in the butt to do that. But again, the key takeaway is that in order for a wave function to asymptote to zero, everything has to line up perfectly. We need to have the right value of our wave function. Um, the curvature needs to be such that the wave function changes in just the right way. So when we re reach this inflection point with the curvature that we have, it asymptotes exactly to zero. And if we're just a little bit off, this asymptote won't be zero. It will asymptote either to some other finite number, usually not. Usually it will inevitably end up diverging. So because these asymptotes can only exist for very particular values of energy, our state can only exist with those particular values of energy. This is essentially the origin of the quantization of the energy levels of electrons in the hydrogen atom. Obviously, a hydrogen atom is more complicated than this simple little diagram here, but it is really the same principle. This gray wave function that we started with is actually called the ground state wave function. It represents the lowest energy state that can exist for this potential energy. It turns out that with quantum mechanical bound states, um, the lowest possible amount of energy is not zero. This lowest amount of energy is called the ground state energy, or sometimes the vacuum energy of the system. That energy cannot be extracted from the system in any way because there is no, or, no lower energy state for the system to decay into. Just like an electron in the ground state of a hydrogen atom cannot give, give, give off light and fall into a lower state because there is no lower energy state. There's actually another energy state between the gray wave function and the purple one. The purple wave function is actually called our second excited state, or our third energy state. And I know this because it intersects the x-axis twice. One way that we can see that there is another energy state with a curvature somewhere between the gray and the pink or purple is to imagine, let's start on the left-hand side. Let's say, okay, we know we have to, we want to asymptote on the, on the left. The next excited state should occur at a higher amount of curvature. Higher curvature means increasing the amount of energy of our system. So if we increase the curvature on the left-hand side, then our wave function already has a steeper slope at this inflection point, and it's going to have a, a steeper curvature, a greater curvature than the gray function had, which means it's going to start bending downwards before it reaches the middle. And it'll end up looking something like this. If the curvature wasn't quite enough, then it wouldn't start bending back down early enough. And by the time it reaches over here, it would end up just diverging straight down to negative infinity, and that would be a problem. And if it curved a little bit too quickly, then it would possibly have already even gone up to here, in which case it would once again end up diverging too fast or something. It has to be 
perfectly lined up. There's only one value of curvature between the gray and the pink, such that we can have two asymptotes on either end. And this is a general rule for all quantum mechanical bound systems. The ground state will always have zero x-intercepts. The first excited state will always have exactly one x-intercept. The second excited state will always have exactly two. The third would have three and so on. Moreover, if the potential function is symmetric, then the ground state will be symmetric, and the second and fourth and sixth and all the even excited states will be symmetric. But the odd excited states, like the first one, will be anti-symmetric. They will flip from positive to negative. Another way that can help you figure out how to qualitatively draw a wave function based off of a potential is to think of it like this. In the classically allowed regions where there's enough energy to exist classically, the wave function will be wave-like. It'll oscillate. On the other hand, in any classically forbidden region, like uh, over here or over here, the wave function will be exponentially decaying towards the x-axis. Just to show this a little bit tidier, here's a diagram that doesn't rely on my drawing abilities. This kind of potential is called a finite square well because it's like square and no smooth edges or anything. There's a low value of potential and then there's a sudden step up on either side, kind of just like a well, literally like a well in the ground. The ground state is this bump, this uh, first excited state or the second energy level is given by this where it intersects the x-axis once and the second excited state or third energy level intersects the x-axis twice. I want to emphasize again, if you drew one or more of these flipped upside down um, over the x-axis, basically multiplying it by negative one, there's no physical difference because when you take the magnitude squared of the wave function, you'll get the same result. And here's another example we can use to understand how the relative amplitude of different parts of the wave function compare to each other as well as how the wavelength essentially varies. This time we're using a potential that looks a bit different. We've got a tall plateau on the left, then it drops down suddenly, and then the potential increases linearly up until a certain point where it levels off again at a lower height than it did on the left-hand side. And to make the wave function's behavior clearer, here we're talking about the seventh energy state, and we do that because it means that the, uh, the wave function will oscillate more and we can see the properties more clearly. And you can count that there are one, two, three, four, five, six x-intercepts, which makes sense because it's the sixth excited state. As you can see here, the wavelength is shorter on the left and bigger on the right. So the deeper the potential well, or the greater the difference between the energy of our state and the uh, value of the potential at that position, the faster the wave function oscillates. This makes sense. Again, if E minus V is large, then we have a greater curvature. And if we have a greater curvature, it means we're going to end up completing a full cycle faster because it just, you know, it bends quicker. But it also results in having a smaller amplitude in regions where E minus V is very large. And that's because if the wave function is curving very quickly, it doesn't really have time to build up and have a large value. It curves back down towards the x-axis very rapidly. But once we get to a region where E minus V is very small, that means the curvature is very small, which means it takes a long time for the wave function to bend back towards the x-axis. And so it increases for longer amounts of time. And so as a result, when E minus V is large, the wave function oscillates rapidly and with a small amplitude. But when E minus V is very small, the wave function oscillates slowly and with a large amplitude. Qualitatively, we can also understand this the following way. In a region over here, E minus V is very large, which means most of the energy of the system would, classically speaking, uh, be in the form of kinetic energy. Our, our particle would be expected to have a large momentum in this region. That means if, if in this region, the particle is moving very quickly. And as a particle enters the region over here where E minus V is very small, most of the energy of our system is now in the form of the potential energy. So our particle will be moving very slowly. So if this were a classical system, 
This might re uh, be represented by a particle moving very fast and then slowing down, and maybe bouncing back. And as it goes this way, it would speed back up again, and then it would slow down again. And it bounce back this way, and it would speed up again, slow down again. And you can see that the particle would spend most of its time in the region where e minus v is small, because that's where it's moving slowly, and so it'll spend more time there. Now that's not what's going on quantum mechanically. Our particle is not literally a little billiard ball bouncing back and forth between um, these two positions. Our particle is the wave function. Our particle, until you measure its position, is in a superposition of positions. In fact, it's in, in, in a superposition of an infinite number of positions. But it has a definite value of energy, so long as it remains in this superposition of position. If we then perform a measurement and find the particle right here, well, now it has a definite position state, more or less, which means it no longer has a definite energy. We can also talk about what happens in the classically forbidden regions. So on the left-hand side, e minus v is a very large negative number. e is much smaller than v, and so this becomes a large negative value. Forget the sign for now. If e minus v has a large magnitude, that once again means our curvature will be fairly large, which means as our wave function asymptotes towards zero, it does so very rapidly. Its curvature becomes very large um, over here. So it asymptotes towards the x-axis very fast. Now you might say, well, it's still very large over here, but the curvature goes to zero. As the wave function asymptotes towards zero, psi asymptotes towards zero. And a finite number times zero is zero. So it asymptotes very rapidly over here because e minus v is very large, but once the wave function is close to zero, it levels off essentially towards zero. The same thing happens on the right side but e minus v is a much smaller value over here, which means once we are over here, the curvature is very small. So it will gradually tend towards the x-axis. And eventually, when the wave function is small enough, uh, once again, the curvature levels off to zero, and it basically flatlines or asymptotes from there on. And those are really all the rules that you need in order to qualitatively come up with the solutions to the Schrodinger equation for any given potential. If you want actual values and you want to do math with it, of course, you'll need to solve the differential equation, which we will learn how to do. But oftentimes, um, this can be enough, especially at our little introductory level. But before we call it quits, I want to go back to the example of the square well. The classical analog to this square well potential is just two walls separated by, in this case, a distance L. And of course, we're restricting ourselves to just one dimension of motion for now. So basically, this is a box with walls. Now, the height of this potential is not so much how tall the physical walls would be in our classical analog, but it's more like how thick they are and how hard it would be for whatever uh, ball or particle you put in here to break through the wall or burrow into it. But if this were just a box with a ball bouncing back and forth classically, we would expect the probability of finding the ball anywhere to be equal. If the ball is just bouncing back at a constant speed corresponding to a particular amount of energy, it would just bounce back and forth at a constant speed, assuming the collision is elastic. And so it's just as likely to be found in any one place as any other. That is clearly not true in the quantum mechanical sense. These are just the wave functions, but we can already analyze where our particle would be most likely to be found in a quantum mechanical box. In the ground state, it would be most likely to be found somewhere in the middle and it would be very unlikely to be found near the edges, and there would be some non-zero, but very small chance to be found outside the box. In the next energy state, you would never find it right in the middle. You're most likely to find it somewhere around here and somewhere around here, where the wave function peaks, whether it's positive or negative. You're also a little bit more likely to find it at the edges than we were in the previous example. And in a third energy state, we're quite likely to find it in the middle again, and we're also quite likely to find it near the edges, but we're not likely to find it more or less where the previous peaks were. This is super strange, and by the way, think about it like this. Here we have a, a particle in a box, and we're likely to find it over here, and we're likely to find it over here, and we will never 
find it right here. There is a region between the two places where the particle is most likely to be found that the particle will never be. You really cannot think of this as a ball bouncing back and forth because the ball will never be here. A ball bouncing back and forth would have to be in the middle at some point. But what we have shown is that the ball will never be found right there. The wave function really is the particle. To show this more clearly, here's another diagram, but this time of the actual probability densities. So the wave function's magnitude squared. Once again, these graphs are always positive valued because we're talking about the magnitude of the wave function squared. But there are a couple other differences too. First of all, you'll notice that instead of plotting the third energy level on this bottom graph over here, we're plotting the probability density for the 20th energy level. And the other difference is that here the wave function goes to zero at the edges of the box, whereas here they don't. And the way that we can make the wave function go to zero at the edges of the box is to say that v of x never levels off, but rather it has an infinite value to the left and right of our box, and it has a value of zero inside of our box. If the potential has an infinite value, that means the curvature is going to be infinite. And if the curvature is infinite, it basically means the wave function just has to plop down at zero, and it, it, there'll be a kink there, and it'll just level out like that. We will actually see this later on. The real point of this, though, is to show that in the quantum mechanical state, we do still recover the classical behavior of a ball bouncing back and forth, where it's equally likely to be found everywhere. In the ground state, it's most likely to be found near the middle of the box. In the first excited state, it's most likely to be found in either half of the box, but never right in the middle and never at the edges. But as we go to higher and higher energy states, now the particle is likely to be found at a lot of different positions. Now in between each of these peaks, there's also a place where we'll never find the ball. But as we go to higher and higher energy levels, the peaks become squished so closely together that they are barely distinguishable from each other. And then eventually, it looks like a continuous distribution of possibilities. This is the correspondence principle in action. For very high energy states, the system behaves classically again. Now, in this case, of course, we can still see the quantum mechanical behavior, but here, for example, is what the 100th energy level looks like. Long story short, quantum mechanical behavior is most noticeable when you're near the ground state of a system. But when you're at a very high energy state, it becomes less and less noticeable. And last, but not least, is quantum tunneling. The idea behind quantum tunneling is as follows. Imagine we have a really tall mountain with flat planes on either side and that a ball is rolled towards the mountain from the left. If the ball is rolled, but not fast enough to make it all the way up the hill, it'll roll up the hill until it reaches the highest point it can where all of its kinetic energy has been converted into potential energy, and then it will roll right back down the hill and away again. And if you roll the ball the same exact way every single time, that will happen every time. The ball will never end up on the other side of the mountain, if you don't give it enough energy to make it over the top. If quantum tunneling worked at macroscopic scales as well, then sometimes when you roll the ball towards the mountain, it would start to roll up the mountain, it would get maybe part way, and then suddenly it would find itself over on the other side. It didn't go over the mountain, it didn't have enough energy to go over the mountain. It went through the mountain. It didn't dig a hole through the mountain, it was over here, and then it was over here. A more physically reasonable example of quantum tunneling is with an electron in a circuit with a break in it. Here we have a battery hooked up to a metal bar on one side, a metal bar on another side, and a vacuum in between them. This battery will drive electrons counterclockwise around this circuit, but they would pile up here until a potential difference arises across these. But the vacuum is a really good insulator, so electrons can't just go from here to here there is a potential barrier. I've labeled the potential energy V of X for the electrons in blue. The total energy provided to our system is given by this line over here. It's basically the energy provided by our batteries. And on the left-hand side, we can see that our electrons have a little bit more energy 
than the potential energy. That basically just means that in this piece of metal, the electrons have enough energy that they can sort of mosey around along a little bit, but um, they don't have a ton of energy. They're not flying around super fast or anything. However, the battery doesn't provide enough energy for the electrons to overcome the barrier of the vacuum. The vacuum represents a large value of potential. In order to, for the electron to go from the metal into the vacuum, it needs a large amount of energy. The, in other words, the potential energy of an electron in the vacuum is very large. On the other hand, if an electron were to cross the vacuum and reach the right-hand metal bar, it would have a great deal of energy because the right-hand metal bar is being held at a lower potential energy for an electron by the battery. That being the case, the electrons, once they cross the vacuum, would be able to move rather quickly. Um, they would be attracted by this positive uh, terminal of the battery. So they would tend to have a great deal of kinetic energy, and that means that their wave function would oscillate more rapidly and at a smaller amplitude. Classically, the right-hand side is irrelevant because the electron would never get through here. The battery just doesn't give them enough energy. But quantum mechanically, that's not the case anymore. The wave function of the electron decays exponentially in this classically forbidden region where it doesn't have enough energy to exist. But it doesn't reach zero before it reaches the other side, so it still is non-zero over here, at which point at the wave or the V is less than E, and so now, once again, it starts to oscillate. In other words, if you have an electron over here, there is a non-zero, albeit usually small chance, for the electron at some later time to be found over here. You shouldn't think of it as the electron literally moving through this barrier, but rather the electron has a chance of being found on the left-hand side and a smaller chance of being found on the right-hand side. And technically speaking, if I put an electron over here by hand, well, at first I know it's on the left-hand side, so it only has a chance to be on the left-hand side. But as time goes on and its wave function evolves according to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, um, eventually its wave function would evolve into something that looks more like this, and next time we look, there would be some chance of finding it on the other side. Even though, again, the electron didn't literally move through the vacuum. It simply was on the left, and then it was on the right. Quantum tunneling is an immensely important phenomenon. It's used in lots of technologies, from transistors to scanning tunneling microscopes, which allow us to actually observe and measure atomic scale detail in macroscopic objects. But quantum tunneling is also in part responsible for the nuclear processes within the sun that not only keep the sun uh, held up against gravity, but also that provides all the energy on Earth that we use all the time. The predominant fusion process that happens in the sun relies on the fusion of two protons. But two protons repel each other very, very, very strongly when they get very close together. And it turns out that this Coulomb barrier, this repulsive force between the protons, is strong enough to prevent the pressure of the entire mass and weight of the sun of squeezing them together. However, they can get squeezed close enough together that even though the Coulomb force is enough to hold them apart, they have a chance of tunneling through that Coulomb barrier and fusing together, even though they weren't actually really given enough energy to cross the barrier. But once they get close enough for the strong nuclear force to overpower the Coulomb force, um, it doesn't matter. So essentially you can think of the protons um, or a proton being over here and the Coulomb barrier is over here and there's not enough energy to actually force the proton through the Coulomb barrier, but since the energy state is lower on the other side, in other words, this energy state of two protons bound together is less than two protons separated from each other, there is a chance for the protons to be in the separated state and then to suddenly be in the fused state. Now I encourage you to think back to the fact that the Schrodinger equation wasn't derived, it was a guess and it made some pretty shaky assumptions. And yet, it's able to make predictions as deep and strange as quantum tunneling. And after these phenomena were discovered through the math of the Schrodinger equation, they were also discovered experimentally in labs. A great deal of science is really about 
throwing darts at a dartboard and seeing which one stick. Sometimes you hit a, dart, a bullseye, and other times you miss the board entirely, and you have no idea what's going to happen until you try it. If you are thinking of going into the sciences of doing scientific research, that's one thing that you really have to get used to. You have to get used to failure. Most, most scientists' ideas fail. We don't usually hear about those because they didn't work. We hear about the successes, but most scientists spend the vast majority of their time failing over and over and over, learning what doesn't work, and eventually stumbling across things that do.